Okay, thanks for coming on, on Friday morning. Um, so today uh, we're going to continue talking about uh, the family of H3 graphs. Uh, and if time permits, then I'll also say a few words about the proof of, of the general containers theorem. Okay, so let me, let me start by reminding you what we have uh, proved last time. So there's a th first there was a theorem which characterized uh, H3 graphs with large number of edges, with whose number of edges is close to, uh, close to the maximum, close to the extremal number. But also actually we proved something stronger. We characterize graphs which contain, whose number of edges is close to the extremal number for a particular graph H, but they contain few copies of this forbidden subgraph H. So let me summarize it in, in this theorem. So let's call it supersaturation plus robust stability. Okay, so the parameters is we have some graph H uh, and some positive constant delta, and we claim that there exists some positive epsilon such that the following is true for every and vertex graph G. Uh, so two parts. So first of all, uh, if we have few copies of the forbidden graph H, then it means we can't be too, too uh, high above the critical density. Uh, so if G has at most epsilon times n to the VH copies of H, then the number of edges of G is at most the extremal number plus this fixed constant delta n squared. And the second part, which is maybe a bit more interesting, says that if the number of edges of G is close to the extremal number, it's Ex nh minus epsilon n squared, then either uh, the number of copies of H and G is at least epsilon n to the V of H, like above. But if it's not the case, then the only reason for it not to be the case is that our graph G is close to being a chi H minus one partite graph. So, or one can delete at most delta n squared edges to make g chi h minus 1 partite. So we, we prove this characterization to combine it uh, with the structural description with the covering of the family of uh, all H3 graphs with, with these containers, uh, each of them containing few copies of, uh, of H. So let me remind you what we proved exactly. And then to this characterization and this, this theorem about uh, the family of H3 graphs to be being covered by few sparse graphs, we can derive several interesting corollaries. So this we know with a fairly good dependence. Okay. Uh, this we know with the bad dependence because the proof I gave used uh, the removal lemma. But the, the argument uh, that I presented in the end, the argument of Zoltan Furedi, has been modified by, by Yoshi, Rob, and, and several of their students to yield such a statement with very, very explicit dependence between epsilon de and delta, but only in the case where the forbidden graph H is a clique. It's, so, so they have, I, I, f I forgot their statement. Their statement is roughly as follows. If the number of edges if of G is extremal number of H minus T, and say 
in order to make it bipartite, you have to delete at least two T edges. And then there is some function of T which, is, which tells you how many copies of it. And it's, it's, I think it's uh, optimal up to some, uh, some absolute constant. So that at the moment remains only, only for H that's a flip. Yes, that yes, because yes, even, even the proof of Zoltan, if you want to prove stability for an arbitrary uh, graph H, how Zoltan does it, he has this really nice argument for the clique. And then if he wants to prove it for general age, then he just applies the regularity lemma and uses the same argument, the cluster graph, which is a bit of a cheat, yeah. And there is no reason to think that the dependence should be there. No, I think actually uh, that this statement, um, one should be able to prove it using some averaging argument. So the same argument is here. If you try to apply it here, the, the only thing would have to sh show that it's with positive probability, not only you get something of the right density, but also of the right structure. I, it seems intuitive that it is the case, but I... There is no indication that something like the construction is... is. Good. So I, I haven't thought about it in that much detail, but it doesn't seem that really this, this bad dependence is necessary, because it's a really, really dense graph. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the other part... Uh, is the corollary uh, of, of the container's theorem. And it says the following, that for every, for every h and epsilon, uh, there is a constant c is such that uh, there is a family S uh, of graphs on n vertices uh, each S uh, in S uh, contains at most a constant times this pH, which we'll discuss in a minute, times n squared edges. And there are two functions, a function G, which for every, to every H-free graph on n vertices, assigns one of these, uh, these graphs S, and another function F, which to any of these graphs, and therefore also to, to any of the H3 graphs, uh, assigns a graph, some n-vertex graph also, but with the property that the number of copies of H is less than epsilon n to the VH. So using this characterization, we know that if this graph in the image here has many edges, then we know something about this structure. And uh, the key property is that now any, any graph G, which is H3, is contained between its label G of G and this F of G of G. Okay, so I still haven't told you what, what this constant pH is. But let me first say what we're, what we're aiming to prove. So we'll use these two statements to deduce the f answers to the following questions. Uh, the first question is, what is the largest H3 subgraph of the random graph G and P. And the second question, what does a typical graph G in, which is H3, has n vertices in m edges look like? Uh, no, sorry, so, so this was a bit confusing. Fn, uh, so Fn of H, these are so graphs G which don't contain uh, a copy of H okay. and have n vertices. And here Fnm is uh, graphs which have m edges, n vertices, and no copy of H. Yes? Uh, 
uh, yes, for which for which the conditions hold. So we'll compute we'll compute it in uh, we'll compute it in a second. Um, so what is the largest H3 subgraph of GNP? So I, I, I take the yeah I take the a graph from the distribution GNP. I ask typically what is the largest H3 subgraph of it. Okay, so maybe let's start with some guesses of what the answers here would be. Uh, I mean, I'm going to first maybe guess the answers and then we'll just prove that I guessed right. So, in order to answer this, this first question, let me introduce a new, uh, new parameter which generalizes the, the Turan number. So, given a large graph G and a small graph H, I can ask the following question. What is the largest H free subgraph of G? So this will be the maximum number of edges of some G prime, which doesn't contain H, but itself is contained in the graph G. So the usual to run, uh, to run number would be just EX of K and H. Now, uh, can you give me some lower bound on EXGH? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yes, exactly. And then this gives me already the same density as in Turan's. I mean, actually, I can do maybe just slightly better by just covering sort of symmetrically averaging over all embeddings of the maximum H3 graph into Kn, I can get this many edges, which is essentially what Nati said. So somehow, Turan's theorem, the lower bound in Turan's theorem is always true for an arbitrary graph G. So the only interesting question here is whether G contains larger H3, H3 graphs. So the real question is when, or for what p, uh, the reverse inequality holds. Now, so this was, this was number one. Uh, and of course, the reverse inequality holds for p equals one, because this is just the statement of Turan's theorem. And we might ask ourselves, how low can we go with p so that this is this is still true. And this question w is usually uh, known as, or the answer to it is the random version or random analog of Turan's theorem. So it's the correct value of p was conjectured in the 90s by Kohaya, Kava, Uchak, and Little. There were many partial results. and. Uh, eventually, this question was resolved by Conlon and Gowers and Schacht several years ago. So we'll show another proof of this. And then the second, uh, for the second question, um, let's try to think of a large family of uh, H3 graphs on, on n vertices and m edges. What I can do is just take one of the Turan graphs, the extremal graph, and consider any of its subgraphs. So we know that f n m of h is at least as large as E x and H, choose M. And one might ask, when is it close to the truth? <coughs> OK, so uh, are the questions uh, are the questions clear and and the problems so let's uh, let's make be give some necessary conditions for for p so maybe i'll do this carefully and and this this less carefully uh, so the idea is that if uh, if the random graph G and P here doesn't contain many copies of H, then we can just delete few edges to make it H3. Uh, and 
this, this inequality won't hold because we'll delete just a very small proportion of the edges. And similarly, here, if at a certain density, a random graph with m edges has few copies of h, then it will mean that for a slightly smaller m, we have many, many different uh, h-free graphs with this smaller m number of vertices, which is much, much larger than that. So now let's, let's try to make it precise. So let's try, let's try to do it for the second question, because the first question is very, very similar to what we already did for arithmetic progression, so just to, uh, to diversify it a little. So here I will fix some small constant epsilon, and let m prime be 1 plus epsilon times m, just slightly, slightly more than m. Now, let's assume that the expected number of copies uh, of H in G and M, which is a uniformly randomly chosen graph with N vertices and M edges, that this is at most epsilon over 2 times M. Now, uh, what does it say? By Markov's inequality, the probability that the number of copies is greater than epsilon m is at most one half. So with probability at least a half, the number of copies is at most epsilon times m. Now, but I have one plus epsilon times m edges, so it means I can delete from each copy one edge and get an edge-free subgraph with exactly m edges. So with probability at least a half, this G, sorry, G and M prime. G and M prime contains one, or at least one, graph from F and M H. And this gives me a lower bound on F and M H. Why? Well, with probability one half, if I start from uh, from a graph with one plus epsilon times m edges, I get an h free graph on the m edges. But the thing is, I might overcount, right? Because each graph with m edges might have been contained in some number of graphs with m prime edges. So I need to say how in how many ways I can now complete this graph on m edges to a graph on n, n, prime edge, n prime edges, so this is n choose 2 minus m times m prime minus m. And this is exactly equal to 1 half m prime choose m. Here, n choose 2 choose m. And if you believe me, when epsilon tends to 0, uh, then this is at least 1 minus little of 1 times n choose 2 choose m. So somehow it's as large as, as it can be. So in particular, if you, if you look at this formula, then since this constant is as small as possible, it means that the typical, typical graph like here cannot be close to any graph with bounded chromatic number. Because if the graph has bounded chromatic number, then it forces a constant proportion of the edges to, to be not present. And even if we allow for, for little changes, then it would have a bound of the form 1 minus some constant c and choose 2 choose m. And this is much greater. So it means that if this holds, then we have no, no structure. OK, so let's, let's unravel this condition. So this expectation, well, it's roughly equal to uh, n to the v of h times 2m over n squared times the number of edges of h. Let's forget about this too. Let's order 
only about the order of magnitude, we want this to be roughly of order m. So this happens uh, if and only if, so let me divide it by n squared and multiply it by, by n squared, uh, if n to the v of h times p to the e of h is equal to p times n squared, where I let p to be m over n squared, which is the p for which in GNP the expected number of copies is, is the expected number of edges, and this gives p uh, to be equal to uh, n to 2 minus v of h divided by e of h minus 1. Uh, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, so, uh, but uh, you're, you're right, it's better to, to write it with, with the minus, yeah. Okay, but there's something uh, which one can do slightly, slightly better. Uh, note that I can perform the same argument for any subgraph H prime of H. So the same should hold for any subgraph H prime of H. Because if I, if, if I manage to delete all copies of H prime, then of course I delete all copies of H. And some, sometimes in expectation it's easier to delete H prime than H. And therefore this P, uh, so let me erase that. In both these questions, P needs to be at least the maximum over all h prime in h n to minus v of h prime minus 2 divided by e of h prime minus 1. And this, so this is equal to n uh, to minus 1 over the so-called 2 density of h, where this 2 density of h is just the maximum over all h prime in h, e of h prime minus 1, v of h prime minus 2. So this is an, a clearly a necessary condition. And also, uh, so by a necessary condition, I mean that M needs to be at least P, let's call it PH, PH times, times N squared for the counting problem, and P needs to be at least PH for the random problem. Now, so let me, uh, let, me, let, let me say it again. In order to expect any typical structure, and in order to, to not have a very large subgraph of GNP, which is H3, we need to satisfy this condition because otherwise there's a trivial argument which tells us that this is not true. And maybe a surprising thing here is that this very obvious necessary condition is also s sufficient for, for these statements to, to be true. Uh, uh, yes, yes, but I mean uh, here anyway I want to put, uh, put an arbitrary large constant. So, th so th that this is the case it was c already conjectured in the 90s by Kohayakawa, Utrak, Riddle, and Penny Huxel. Uh, and in full generality, it was proved by uh, David Conon, Tim Gowers, and Matthias Schacht for, for the random problem, and by Yoshi Balok, Robert Morris, and myself, and by David Saxton and Andrew Thomason for the counting problem. So let me, uh, let me tell you what, uh, what the statements are. Now I'll raise the questions and then already answer them. 
first theorem due to Conlon, Gowers, and Schacht, uh, this is around 2010, says that for every positive delta and graph H, if P is at least some large co some large constant which depends on delta and H times n to minus 1 over this 2 density of H, then asymptotically almost surely the largest H free subgraph of G and P has at most 1 minus 1 over the chromatic number of H minus 1 plus delta uh, times n choose 2 times p edges. OK, that's not everything. Moreover, uh, there is a gamma. So this gamma depends on only on delta. So that asymptotically almost surely, if some subgraph G of G and P is H free and has at least this number, but minus gamma and choose two P edges. So if it's close to the maximal one, then uh, it may be made by part. It may be made into a Turan graph, so chi h minus 1 partite by removing from it at most delta n squared p edges. So just some tiny proportion of the edges. Is, is the statement clear? So we have just sort of a, a version of Turan's theorem in, in G and P. So as I said before, for every graph G, this is the expected number of edges in G and P, which is tightly concentrated. So typically, we'll have the reverse inequality wh where this plus is replaced by a minus, but actually also typically this holds. There's, and this says that, so this says that we cannot do anything better than taking uh, the largest chi h minus 1 chromatic graph. And this says that in order to get close to it, we essentially need to, to take the largest chi h minus 1 chromatic graph. Okay, so <coughs> maybe before. Is this known whether this is uh, also valid for, for <coughs> puzzle elements? Or yes, so there are statements uh, proved for quasi random graphs but David, by David Kono, Jacob Fox, and Yufei Zhao. But for quasi random graphs, the problem is that. There is no obvious necessary condition for, for the density or for the, for the jumbledness parameter. Because we, apart from the construction of Noga of, uh, of a nice pseudorandom triangle free graphs, we actually lack, uh, lack constructions which would establish some necessary conditions. So uh, they do obtain some results with some sufficient conditions for, for jumbledness and for the density. But it's not clear how, uh, how far too, too optimal they are. Uh, with this density, no. Mm. Uh, and also, there's a v in this area, there's a really, really interesting question. So there's this construction of Noga, uh, of a graph of, uh, which is n to the 2 thirds regular, and has the smallest possible second eigenvalue. And they prove that if you put, if, if the graph has, uh, if, if the average degree of the graph, this, this pseudo-random graph, is just by large constant larger than, than this construction of Noga. So it's a triangle-free graph. So itself, it's, uh, it's triangle-free. So the constant here would be 1. Then already the Turan statement is true. So I think this was proved by Tibor Sabo, Benny Sudekov, and Van Vu. Uh, but David, uh, Jacob, and Yufei prove also this structural statement that actually uh, the largest ones will be close to, to bipartite. The problem is that in order to get this statement, they need to assume stronger condition on the pseudorandomness. And it's not clear 
uh, whether it's necessary or not. So somehow for the density, to prove that this density statement, it's enough to assume one condition, but in order to prove this structural statement, you need to make this condition stronger. And it's not, I mean, there's no agreement. I talked to Matthias also about this, and somehow they have, Matthias thinks that it's really necessary, and then David says that he thinks it's not necessary, it's no just an consensus. artifact. There's no consensus, so it's not really, it's not really clear. Uh, so let me also state the other theorem, the counting theorem. So this statement was already derived by Thomas Wuchak around 2000 from the so-called Kohayakawa Wuchak riddle conjecture, which was at the time not proved, and it was proved only in, in these two, two papers. So now let H uh, be a non-bipartite graph. and we fix some positive constant delta. Now, the assertion is that there exists a large constant C such that if the number of edges M is at least this large constant times uh, N to 2 minus 1 over this 2 density of H, then almost all H free graphs uh, which contain N vertices and M edges may be made chi H minus one partite by removing at most delta m edges. So the bulk of these graphs uh, come from taking just a subgraph of the extremal graph and maybe modifying it on, say, 1% of, of the edges. And maybe here a few comments are in order. Actually, for, for certain graphs h, especially within the case where h is a clique, so say when h is a triangle, much stronger statement is are known. If here, uh, for the lower bound on M, I add a, an extra polylogarithmic factor, then actually I can take this delta to be zero. So f if H is the triangle, then uh, this condition is equivalent to saying that M is at least some large constant times N two three halves. And it was proved by Osthus, Pr uh, Prümmel, and Taras in 2004 that if one puts another square root of log n here, then actually almost all triangle-free graphs with this number of edges are actually bipartite, so without, without any modification. And maybe a more interesting, even more interesting uh, fact about the, the statement is that this property of being exact, typically exactly bipartite has a, has a sharp threshold. So there is a particular constant, if I go just uh, above this constant by a factor of 1 plus epsilon, then this is true with probability tending to 1. And if I multiply by 1 minus epsilon, this is not true with probability tending to 1. So this is Osthus, Prima, and Taras. And recently, together with Yoshi Balog, Rob Morris, and Lutz Warnke, we proved this for arbitrary uh, cliques. So here also, uh, starting from this bound, if you add uh, log n in the power 1 over the number of edges in the clique minus 1, then also there is a constant which you, you can fairly easily compute, which gives you the th sharp threshold for the property that the typical graph is exactly r partite, not just approximately r partite. Okay. Uh, any questions? All right, so let's 
I'll try to sketch the, the proofs of, of these theorems, not, maybe not with all the computational details because they're, they're a little intricate, but just give you, to give you the idea. And now let's, let's start with this random statement. Uh, so we will need this and that. So let I unfortunately I need to erase the statement. Now <coughs> this is somehow the statement that we're trying to prove is very, very similar to the statement of this random analog of Semradi's theorem that, that I showed to you yesterday. Now there the idea was let's just count uh, all the H3 graphs and prove using the union bound or the first moment argument that in, we don't expect to see large H3 subgraphs in GNP and therefore uh, we can conclude this bound on the Duran number. So let's try to do this here. Now there are at least EX and H choose M graphs on M with M edges. Uh, so now I'm, I'm trying to give an argument which doesn't work, okay. uh, and then we'll learn something from it, and then we'll, we'll fix it. Okay. Now, so what is the expected number of H3 subgraphs in GNP uh, with M edges? And somehow the idea is I would like to take M to be just this Turan density plus some delta times N choose 2P and conclude that this is little of what? This would be su clearly sufficient. But we have this lower bound, so we cannot, definitely we cannot do better than that here. So this is at most, or th sorry, this is at least uh, EX and H, which is, sorry, EX and H choose m, and for each particular one, the probability is p to the m. Now, if m is subquadratic, then this binomial coefficient is very well approximated by the Euler constant times <coughs> this divided by m raised to the m. So this is very well approximated by e times the extremal number uh, divided by m times p to the m. Now, for this to be little O of 1, what do I need to assume about M? Well, M needs to be fairly large. M needs to be at least E times the extremal number times P. And I mean, this is much larger than the expected number of, of edges in GNP. So unfortunately, this approach will not work. So you cannot conclude just from a first moment argument that this, the statement is true because there are just too many graphs. So what, what is the problem? I mean, still, you, I mean, the theorem is proved, so you can believe me that, that the statement about the probability here is true, but not about the expectation. So it must be the case that I mean, once on some un there are some unlikely events where the number of large H3 subgraphs that appear is, is, is very, very high. And this is because so for one such example would be if we have some cut, if we fix some bipartition in GNP, and there is an unlikely event that the density there will be much larger than the expectation, and this will give us a very, very, this will just drive this expectation very, very high. Now, <coughs> this theorem will, will come to, these two theorems now will come to rescue, and the idea is now that GNP typically doesn't contain a large, say, triangle-free graph, not because there are few triangle-free graphs. There are too many for this to be just true like this. But we know that <coughs> triangle f these triangle-free graphs come are of just very, very few types. There's at most this many types of triangle-free graphs. So if we can prove for a fixed type that GNP doesn't contain any large triangle-free subgraph of this type, then we'll do the union bound over a much, much smaller family. 
And what does allow what does allow us to tell that for a fixed type, GNP doesn't contain any large triangle free subgraphs. So fix a particular type. Now from this theorem, we know <coughs> that we only that all the graphs are of this type are essentially contained in some graph with n squared over four plus delta n squared edges. So in order for there to be a large triangle free subgraph of GNP of this particular type, then GNP itself needs to intersect this graph G in a lot of edges. But this graph is only <coughs> half plus delta of the edges. So by turn of inequality, with very high probability, the intersection won't be larger than, say, half plus two delta. And since the number of types is very small, then the union bound will also be small, and we can sum up these, uh, these probabilities. So this is the, this is the sketch. So let me, uh, let me fill in the details. So what we are trying to estimate is the probability that GNP contains a subgraph G, which is H3, and contains uh, 1 minus 1 over k chi H minus 1 plus, say, 2 delta and choose two p edges. Call this, call this m. Now, the union bound that I'm going to use here is not over these graphs, but rather over these coverings, s. So this is the sum over all s in s. The probability of the same event But further, I want this graph G to be in this particular container defined by S. Now, since each H3 graph is mapped to some S, then each possible graph G will appear here for some S. Okay. Now, this is at most, and here, uh, let me come back to Nati's question from last time. Uh, Nati asked whether uh, this condition is, is important or it's just an artifact of the proof. So actually here, I will use this condition to make this union bound somehow even, to make this probability even smaller, because I don't need to consider these S, which do not fit in, in GNP itself, which wins me another, another huge, huge or small factor, depending on, on what you think. So first of all, for this to be true, if this graph G is to appear in GNP, then also the set itself needs to appear in GNP. So this is P to the power S. Now, uh, let's, let's look at that. What is this probability? So I have some S edges here for free. But the remaining m minus s edges need to all fit in this set. So this is bounded by the probability that the number of edges in G and P intersected with f of s is at least m minus the size of s. Now, this expectation is just p times the number of edges in f of s, but the number of edges of f of s, since f of s has few copies of h, by our characterization, it's at most that. So this is at most p times 1 minus 1 over chi h minus 1 plus, plus delta times n choose 2. Now, so the expectation is is with this delta, and we're looking for something with, with two delta. So by Chernoff's inequality, 
this probability is at most e to minus some constant times delta squared times n choose 2p. And finally, let's now uh, sum over all these uh, these sets S. So there will be a sum from S0 to at most some constant times this pH n squared. Now the number of ways to choose it, it's just n choose 2. Choose S, p to the S times this exponential factor. And then you can believe me that this is uh, this is little of one. We don't have so much time, so maybe let me let me skip the, these computations. Now, what about the stability theorem? Well, the stability theorem, the proof of the stability theorem, goes roughly along the same lines, uh, with one little twist. Uh, what is the twist? Hmm? <laughs> I can't find the eraser, maybe oh, she here. So now we want to bound the probability that GMP contains a graph G which is H free, has uh, at least 1 minus 1 over chi h minus 1 a minus a some gamma and choose two p edges but also it is at least it's not close to to say bipartite for the case of triangle free graphs so there is a further restriction here uh, now uh, we'll do the same thing. We sum over all S with the additional condition that, so let's call this F now, uh, that G of G is S. And repeat the same argument. So we have this P to the S here. But now we estimate this probability differently. So there, by this theorem, uh, there are two possibilities. Now, either our graph G has fewer than the extremal number minus epsilon edges, and then getting m edges here, w even without this restriction, is unlikely. So for S, where the number of edges is less than the extremal number, minus epsilon n squared, since we can choose gamma to be much smaller than epsilon, this is just exponentially unlikely. Uh, but there's another case. What if this, this doesn't hold? I mean, here we cannot just simply use Chernoff, right? But we know that if the number of edges here is, is large, then this graph uh, is very easy to be made bipartite. So there is some bipartition where there's very few edges here and a very few at very few edges here. But now the graph that we want to find in every bipartition it has a lot in one of these color se colored sets. So now we just bound the probability that among these very tiny number of edges we will find a lot in G and P. And this is also extremely unlikely, because this is like the probability that the number of edges in G and P intersected this, this set of delta n squared edges. Uh, this, sorry, say we take here some delta prime, that this is larger than delta n squared P. <coughs> so actually, this is very, very small. So this will be at most e to minus n squared p if we choose delta prime to be sufficiently small. 
Okay, and this, this idea is also the idea behind the proof of the counting statement, where only there the, the difference is that the computational details are a bit more intricate, so let me, let me sketch it. Now, let's try to uh, count these graphs, which are not close to, to say, bipartite. Now, it's enough. We want to say that the typical one is. So it's enough to show that this is much smaller than the family of the ones that we know are bipartite. So it's 1 minus, or actually E x and h choose m. If we show this, then this is just a large family of graphs which are bipartite. So if the ones which are not close are smaller than this, then they're a negligible portion of, uh, of everything. Now, to bound this, we again Yeah, chi h minus minus one partite, oh. partite. Yeah, and so so here we again can just enumerate over all these containers and count just the ones which are far from partite and uh, they get this particular label s. And here we again split into two cases. So this is small. Because for some s, call it s, s small, this f of s, the number of edges there, it's smaller than e x and h minus epsilon n squared. And we just here use the trivial, the trivial bound. Sorry. And even if we sum over all s, so we'll get this factor that I just erased. Now this is small. And there's another family where we can't use this trivial argument. Call it s large. But now, again, by this characterization, we know that every such graph needs to be far from partite. Sorry, it needs to be close to partite. But if it's close to partite, and we're counting only the graphs which are far from partite, so we have some, some partition here with very few edges here, with very few edges here, and we can assume that essentially everything in between. And now we want to select some subset of size m, which actually has a large proportion here and a large proportion here. And this is very, very unlikely. So we would write here that from these delta uh, prime and squared edges, we want to select some delta m. And from the remaining ones, 1, uh, sorry, m minus delta m minus s. I mean, here I used a, a pretty crude bound. But still, even with this bound, this is very, very small. If I sum it up over all s, this will be smaller than um, some uh, say delta to the m, this will be super exponentially small times e x and h m. And I omit the computations here because they're, they're somewhat intricate. But the, the thing is, if you say think that m is pretty close to n squared, then this factor could be, could be even 0. That's why it's, it's, it's so small. OK, so that's it uh, about the applications. And maybe we, we have around half an hour left. I can say a few words about how, how this theorem is proved uh, and what the conditions for the maximum degree, how, how they come into play. Just, just a, sort of a few rough ideas. <coughs>
But if you have any questions before, then I'll be happy to answer them. Okay. Uh, sh sure. So, yeah. So there, there is ma yes, there is many open questions. I can so maybe I'll leave the la last five minutes for. So the two different proofs are essentially similar. Or uh, so the proof, the proof of Matthias and and our proof is similar, uh, but the proof of of David Conlon and Tim Gowers is is completely different. So, I mean, this is maybe the more the most interesting proof. Uh, in the sense that it proves something, something somewhat, somewhat stronger. So what David and, uh, and Tim proved is that typically, if you take G and P, then there will be a correspondence between the subgraphs of G and P and the subgraphs of the complete graph, which scales many interesting parameters. So say the model for a certain subgraph of G and P has the same proportion of the edges as its dense model, and then the same proportion of the copies, also same proportion of number of edges in every, sub, sub, every subset of linear size. And therefore, you just pull back the statements that you know uh, from the study of dense graphs into, into the random setting with some, with some small errors. So the key to, to proving such, such a theorem, so, so what we want to prove is, um, so the, the goal is to choose from uh, each independent set in some hypergraph H a representative set of small size, and this will be the set G of I, so that it forces the remainder, which is I minus G of I, to be contained. in something sparse. And crucially, this something sparse has to depend only on, on, on this representative we chose and not on the set itself. <coughs> and what do I mean by this precisely? If we have two sets, i and i prime, and we choose for them the same representative, then we need to push them into the same sparse set. Now, this was exactly the idea in the Kleitman-Winston theorem, where we ordered the vertices by maximum degree, and we just picked the ones of maximum degree which are in our set, and deleted their neighborhoods, because this was independent of what happened later in the ordering. Now, here, the idea is similar, but since we deal with uniform hypergraphs, so I select some vertex, then I cannot immediately delete anything, uh, because every edge has size larger than two. But maybe the first reduction is that it's enough uh, to replace uh, the sparse uh, with, say, of size at most 99% of the vertex set. So why is it true? Suppose I can choose a small representative to push something into a set of size 99%. Now, I look at the set. If, if this set is already sparse, then I've achieved my goal. If it's not sparse, then I just look at the hypergraph induced in, in the set of size 99%, and I apply the same theorem recursively, and I continue shrinking. And since every set which is not sparse has to contain a positive proportion of the vertices of the hypergraph by a maximum degree condition, then it means after a bounded number of steps, I will terminate my, my process. And, and this representative will just be 
the sum of all the representatives that I created. So this is enough. And why, f why would we expect such a thing to be true? So let me just uh, rewrite here, recall the conditions for the maximum degree. So we, we assume that for every L between 1 and K, delta L of H is at most some constant times PL minus 1 times E of H divided by V of H. And this is now, because this is now the only condition that we require on the hypergraph in order for this statement to be true. I mean, of course, this 99% will depend on this constant C. Okay, uh, so why are, these, why are these conditions natural? So first of all, let's start with the easy condition. The easy one is what happens for L equals 1. So if L equals 1, then we just ask the maximum degree to be within a constant range of the average degree. Well, if this is not true, then it could happen that there is a tiny set here which touches every edge. Right? So if this set touches every edge, then everything here is independent. It has size 1 minus little o of 1 of everything. And clearly, it's an independent set, so I cannot push it in any set which has size 99%. So that's why this condition is, uh, is natural. And now let's try to explain. I, I still haven't used this, uh, this function p. So now let's try to explain what this choice of p means. So if uh, somehow a natural approach, or the first rough idea how to, how to construct this, uh, this representative is maybe start with some set i, and then just choose a random subset of its elements. And how do, now do we use this random subset? If I take some edge of size k, and k minus 1 elements of it already lie in my random set, then I have to delete the kth element, because the set is independent. So let's choose elements with probability p. And if I choose it with probability p, then exactly the size of the representative set I get is of the right order. It's p times the number of vertices. Now, uh, what, could, what could go wrong? Uh, so I need to, after such operation, I need to delete a constant proportion of the vertices, at least 1% of the vertices, to shrink the size of this containing set. Now, so at least in expectation, a constant proportion of the vertices should lie in edges whose k minus 1 elements are in this random set. Right? So what is this proportion? Well, for every edge, the probability that it will hit k minus 1 of its elements is roughly p to the k minus 1. Now, uh, this should be uh, at least the number of vertices of h. But here, this, uh, in the proof, we work with multigraphs. So each edge could actually be repeated delta of k times. So I need to, the true number of edges, I need to divide by this maximum multiplicity. And this is precisely this argument for L equals k. So this was L equals k. So now L between 1 and k. What happens here? So this is the case where, so this is somehow the only case which is of interest in the setting of Semradi's theorem. But in the setting of H3 graphs, uh, you saw that there was this problem that actually, some, in order to delete all the copies of H, it's easier to delete uh, the copies of some smaller subgraph. And a similar thing could happen here, because maybe the true bottleneck that we, if you want to delete some vertex, it is possible that every edge which contains this vertex is first contained in some core set uh, of, uh, of edges of size L. So in order to, uh, to delete this vertex, not only we need to 
insert k minus 1 vertices into any some of these k edges, but actually L minus 1 vertices in one of the sets which is contained in, in all of the edges. So how many could we have for a fixed vertex? It's the degree uh, of V, and they could come in groups of delta L, and each of them we have to hit PL minus 1 times. So this needs to be uh, at least happen with positive probability. And now if I sum over all the vertices, then I get E of H here times some constant. And here I get V of H. So this is, this is where this condition comes from. So this condition comes just from, from this random intuition. Now, <coughs> unfortunately, this random intuition is incorrect. It's not what is, what is happening. Uh, and this is because of the following example. So let me give you this example for graphs. I mean, it's very good to start with this random intuition because it already sort of tells you what, what you should do. But consider the following example. Take n, over two, take n vertices, divide them by 2, put the complete graph here. So it has quadratic number of edges, and the maximum degree is within the average degree. Now, this is an independent set here. How, how do I construct uh, this representative set for it? I mean, anyway, I choose any subset of, of the vertices here. It doesn't touch any edges, so it doesn't create any restrictions whatsoever. So somehow, the restriction for this i will come from the fact that I didn't select any of the vertices on the right-hand side. So therefore, it means that the, the argument needs to, needs to be somewhat delicate. It, it cannot, I mean, these restrictions cannot only come, come from that. It, they can also come from the fact that I could have selected something, but I, I don't do it. And so, so very roughly what what does happen in the proof <coughs> is we, at each step, so the proof will be in the, an induction on the uniformity. So for one uniform hypergraph, the statement is trivial. Now, to reduce from k to k minus 1, we will order the vertices according to their degrees. And similarly, as in, in this kleitman winston proof, for every vertex in turn, we will ask whether it's in our independent set or not. So in this example here, we would put all these vertices in front of these vertices. And now if I say, what is the first vertex that is in our ordering, then this allows me already to jump over, over all these vertices of high degree. And just by making one choice, I already constrain my set to this, to this uh, second half. Now, so I will choose some number of vertices, the first vertices in this ordering that belong to the independent set. And what do I do now? So each of them pierces many edges. And know that my independent set i also needs to be independent in this k minus 1 uniform hypergraph of pierced edges. Uh, so I take all such pierced edges, I construct a k minus 1 uniform hypergraph, and I iterate this process. I mean, there's all sorts of things that could go wrong, because in order to use the theorem inductively for k minus 1, I also need to know that these degree conditions will hold. So when I construct this k minus 1 uniform hypergraph, I need to enforce these new recomputed degree conditions. And here, the, cr the crucial fact is that in order to control, say, the L degree in this k minus 1 uniform hypergraph, so in every step of the procedure, I choose one vertex and all the, the edges touching it. And this L degree cannot grow more than the L plus 1 degree of the original guy. So I will just sort of enforce this bound. I will say that if 
uh, choosing, uh, putting some edges will violate this degree constraint, I will not add them, which then gives the possibility of maybe not creating enough edges, but we, one has to prove that it's, this is not possible. So in the end, two, two things could happen. You either create a dense enough hypergraph of slower uniformity, or you have traveled far enough in your ordering so that you can conclude same as, as, as you concluded here. So yeah, let me maybe not say much more, because then I would have to get uh, too technical. So uh, let's maybe finish with some, uh, some open questions. So here, <coughs> I mean, there is this general method of saying something about the typical element in a monotone, locally defined uh, hereditary property, like not containing H-free graphs. Now, I think the most, the most interesting question in this area would be to say something about bipartite graphs. Uh, so for non-bipartite graphs, we basically know, I, I wouldn't say everything, but we know a lot. We know, I mean, you give me a triangle free graph, you give me a K4 free graph, you give me a C5 free graph, and I can tell you that typically it looks exactly like this. This fails dramatically for, for bipartite graphs, and even this very, very simple question how many bipartite graphs, so, sorry, how many say, um, take the cube, uh, Q3, so it's a bipartite graph with, with eight vertices. First of all, the question, what is the Turan number for this graph is not known. And second of all, how many of them are there? It's also, it's also not known. Now it, there is, so what, what the theorem does is that it tells you, I will give you the bound for free if you prove to me, for me, the following statement, which is a conjecture of Erdos and Shimonovich. So there's a conjecture of Erdos and Shimonovich. Uh, let H be bipartite, but not a forest. And suppose that the number of edges in an n vertex graph G is at least some large constant times the extremal number for this bipartite graph prove that the number of copies of H in Gn is at least of the same order of magnitude as the expected number of copies of H in Gn E of G. So in the random graph with the same number of edges. If you, so if you knew this statement, then with not, possibly with not too much work, this already implies that the number of, uh, of graphs not containing H is at most two to the constant, to a constant times the extremal number for H. And this was also asked by Erdes. And apart from few uh, particular graphs H, the even cycles, which was proved very recently by Rob Morris and David Saxton, uh, and complete bipartite graphs. And this is my work with Yoshi Balog. Uh, this is completely, completely open. I mean, this question seems to be very closely related to the so-called Sidorenko's conjecture, uh, which says that somehow the, the conclusion is very similar, but the, the Sidorenko's conjecture says that if we take any graph G on n vertices with constant density P, then the number of copies of any bipartite graph in this graph is at least as large as 
the expected number of copies in GNP. So the GNP is the minimizer for the number of copies. So these questions seem to be, I mean, they sort of work for different ranges of parameters, but they seem to be uh, very, very closely related. So uh, this question is also very, very closely tied uh, with the question of, of very fine characterization of, of H3 graphs, even when H is not bipartite. So let me, <coughs> let me give you uh, s some example. Now, as I said, it's known, I mean, this was proved uh, by Erdes, Kleitmann, and Rothschild in 76, that almost all triangle-free graphs are bipartite. So what, what does it mean if I take uniformly at random, choose an, a triangle-free graph on n vertices, this is, I get more or less the same distribution as choosing a random bipartite graph with n vertices. Uh, now, as I said, such statements can be generalized to arbitrary large cliques. And uh, the, uh, here the idea is that uh, the maximum, say, K4 free graph has a very simple structure. It's just a blow up of the triangle. <coughs> These sets are empty. And this already gives you um, the typical behavior. Now, <coughs> if you take more complicated, say, four colorable graphs, then the extremal number for this graph, I mean, it's, it's essentially this, but you're also allowed to put some small graphs here, which say, avoid AC4, and here avoid something else, and so on. So now, in order to understand what a typical graph from this family looks like, you should also understand what a typical graph from this family looks like, because I mean, this will give you some bound on the number of choices you can make here, here for the partite state. So somehow, for these approximate statements, all of this is noise. But if you want some precise statement, then, then this, this noise becomes actually very, very uh, very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, to move this 1 plus little 1 from the exponent to the base, it's, it's a very, very difficult task. OK, and I think I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs>